Hi, all of you. Welcome to today's lecture series by Shankar Academy of Vision. And today we have Dr. Kurt Backstrom. And sir has completed his OD and followed with that fellowship in COVD and fellowship from FNORA. And sir is also a fellow of American Academy of Optometry. And Dr. Kurt is practicing as a private practitioner for VT Clinic. And uh, Sir is also practicing in Samaritan Rehabilitation Center. And Dr. Kurt is going to talk about on today's topic on binasal occlusion. So it's over to you, Sir. All right, great. Thank you. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, to share with you all at the Sakara Eye Foundation. Uh, it's a wonderful meeting that you have here, and I feel very honored to be able to come and share with you today. Today, our topic is going to be binasal occlusion. And some people believe that this may possibly be our very best tool in our toolbox because it's something that you can use basically with any patient without even having to prescribe a new prescription. So it's a very important tool for a variety of different types of conditions. Basically, I, this is a view off uh, the top of Mount, Ray, Mount uh, St. Helens looking down in the crater in Mount Rainier, we have a lot of volcanoes in our area and uh, just some beautiful sites to remember that each time that you work on adding a tool into your toolbox, that there is usually more to learn. And I can tell you that I've learned a lot about binasal occlusion over the years and each day I continue to learn more. So it's quite an adventure, I believe, for all of us. So in regards to tools in the toolbox, basically we have lenses, prisms, selective occlusion, which we would include binasals, visual guidance, which means recommending uh, taking appropriate breaks and things like from electronic devices and such, and then vision therapy and vision rehabilitation. Binasals is probably the most common type of occlusion. Of course, you're also aware of complete occlusion for one eye and other types of factors, but binasal is what we're going to talk about. And the thing that I want you to think about is that a binasal occlusion isn't just a something you do. You have to modify it over time. And as your patient improves, you change it and fit the needs of that particular patient. So how do we modify it? Well, one thing is the width. It could be a very narrow binasal or a wider binasal. You can be symmetrical. One can be more so and one can be less so and being asymmetric as well. You may be using some binasal occlusions for near reading or just far. Also remember, instead of just always talking about a binasal, you can also have just a nasal sector where only one side is there. Pres prescribing these, you can use them on a part-time or a full-time basis. And then we'll discuss a little bit how we place them on our lenses for our patients. The key to take home message today is what are your patient's needs and how can you help them change their visual performance to meet those needs? The binasal is a great tool for that. So here's an example. What we've done is we use a typically a nail polish that we blot and it becomes opaque. You can see that he has a binasal and I've marked with a blue pen here where they are. Right side slightly wider than the left. He was a left esotrope and this helped him in regarding keeping his eyes aligned. Here is a single nasal sector only on one side. Just another example. What's interesting is sometimes occasionally we'll get patients that come in that understand it. They realize the problem with a full occlusion is you lose peripheral vision, which then affects your balance. And sometimes patients, I've had patients come in like this where they actually cut out and made their own nasal sector with a regular patch because they needed their vision in the periphery for balance. So they really get it. Now, why use binasal occlusion? Well, we'll talk about amblyopia. If you've got a patient that uh, has amblyopia and you're trying to do possibly some unilateral therapy, what happens is, is that they lose their peripheral vision. They do not like that. But yet, if you go ahead and do a partial occlusion on one side, anytime they look over to the left side, they're gonna use the left eye, which means during the whole day, they'll be using treatment for that eye. You can use it for strabismus, and also use it for traumatic brain injury. So basically there's a lot of different, different reasons why we use binasal occlusion. And of course the width and such, the characteristics of it are always different. 
in therapy, we want to look at working from a lot of times monocular work, which could be a binasal, but a, bi but a binasal then allows you to work between the two eyes and alternate them freely. Another aspect of the binasal is that it shuts down a little bit of the central vision and helps the person become more aware of the periphery. The goal is to help modify your patient's visual behavior and performance so they can have better success in their visual skills. Now, what we're gonna say first of all is that a lot of times there are some misassumptions of binasals, some misunderstandings of binasals. First of all, some people say a binasal, oh, that's used for straightening the eyes. Well, yes, we know that in some cases it will, but it can also change the behavior to promote a patient to develop alignment and, and keep their eyes straight. So basically it's only a tool. It doesn't do anything to the patient. It's what the patient does with the binasal that's critical. Some believe that there's only one way to do it. There's only one width. You go to the uh, nasal iris of each eye. No, it depends on what you're trying to work on. It can be modified depending on the patient's visual needs. Some people suggest it's done to the patient. I would, I would disagree. I would say you provide a new environment for that patient, a new set of visual circumstances that they can then respond to. And lastly, sometimes people will say either it works or it doesn't. I've had colleagues that have put on a, put on a binasal and said, oh, it didn't straighten their eyes, so it didn't work, so I'm gonna take it back off. Sometimes it takes time for these, for these uh, changes to occur. So you get sometimes alignment right away. Sometimes you may get alignment down the road with maybe some adjunctive vision therapy. So again, there are short versus long-term effects of the binasals. Now, basic considerations. When you have a narrower prism, narrower, the visual sensory input of both eyes is wider. So we have more sensory input. But at the same time, when you have a binasal that's narrow, there is not a lot of motor component to it. Let's talk about an infantile esotropia. Infantile esotropes basically have an abduction deficit and cannot get either eye out very well. So in that case, we might go to a wider binasal because then the patient has to look all way over to the left to be able to see anything. So we can use a narrow prism, which seems to have more input for sensory and less motor effect. And then when you go wider, there's more of an effect on the motor system and less effect on sensory overlap. The third piece of this slide is considerations of asymmetry. So if I have a primarily right ET, right eye is turning in like this, what happens is you put a binasal over on the left side, it promotes the right eye to come out. So I may go wider on the non esotropic eye to give an opportunity of the patient to start using the right eye in more abduction and more control. So again, asymmetry is another factor as well. So the width and the asymmetry are two really critical factors. Now for some examples, uh, infantile esotropia, generally we go wider because why? They have a motor issue and they need to work on lateral tracking and get their eyes further out. That's the motor component. But yet when they also are given a binasal, what happens is, is that they're promoting nasal to temporal tracking, left eye, nasal to temporal tracking to promote localization with the abducting eye so that then we can promote the right eye leading right gaze, left eye leading and left gaze. For a non-accommodative or a partially accommodative esotropia, we may go more in the mid-range, a narrower one. We can modify again at midline. We'll, we'll talk about how we place the asymmetry depending on the eye turn. And then post-trauma vision syndrome, typically uh, Kefrida and others have found that if you do a very narrow binasal, that's very helpful for many of these patients with the VEP amplitudes. So you may have a VEP amplitude that's low, you place a binasal that's narrow on this patient, and now their VEP amplitudes go up and the patient reports that they feel much more comfortable, less dizziness, less motion, asymmetry motion issues. So let's take a look at monocular and binocular aspects of binasals. First of all, Remember what we're trying to look at is that you've got 
both visual fields, right and left eyes, they overlap in the center. So what happens is, is you have overlap in the center, but in the periphery, you still have monocular. And we believe that that's probably what's going on with the uh, prism, or rather with the binasal, and that it re decreases the uh, noise on the brain so that the amplitude, the signal is much stronger. There's also some considerations of fusion versus diplopia and suppression. So if you think about it, a patient who has um, a more recent lesion that is affecting binocular vision and they have diplopia, it's really not diplopia that causes a concern. It's more the confusion, which means the patient looks out and it's not like they have a single black dot on the wall and there's two. What they go is they go into an environment where let's say there's multiple people and some people's heads will be shifted over on top of other people's bodies. So that is the confusion. Well, when you do have that in a youngster though, what happens is, is that generally these young children develop suppression. So they may develop an asymmetric esotropia or an exotropia. If you place a binasal on, the patient no longer needs to suppress, to actively suppress and get rid of that second image. So the advantage of a binasal for like an esotropia case is that you can work on getting them to be not be able to freely alternate and not develop suppression. So it's basically an anti-suppression device. With the abducting eye, also remember that this leads localization. So when I am looking to my right side, my right eye actually is a faster pathway to get over and left eye follows. There is a slight delay there. And again, that helps you eliminate also cross fixation patterns in an esotropes where the child will have the esotropic eye looking over here and then they look to the left and the right eye looks over to the left. We want them to be abducting with the eye into that gaze and following with the, the adducting eye. So here's just an example of the binasals. So you can see that the crossing of the pattern is where their binocular system is. So if you have a head injury and you're having trouble with some binocular vision and other aspects of vision processing, you mentioned that the overlapping area is the area that's most concerned for these patients. It's a now a noisy visual brain processing going from visual image all the way back to visual cortex and then upward from there. If you place a binasal on, the binocular overlap is actually shrunk. If you look at the bottom slide, so you can see it's a narrower area. So what happens we believe is that if you have a area of binocular vision that's noisy, you reduce the area and now you have less noise in regards to visual processing. So the binasal effectively decreases the noise in these head trauma patients like concussion and minimal traumatic brain injury patients. This is just an example of, again of the uh, image being off to the side, the red target shows up and the right eye has to abduct and then the left eye follow. Again, abduction should lead localization for these patients. Here's just a quick diagram of again, probably why you have that. And if you notice that in going over here, the lateral rectus has a single motor neuron pathway, whereas the medial rectus has two, two. So what you've got is slower information going to the extraocular muscles. But also if you look at data, you'll find that information that's decussating crossing through the optic chiasm actually gets back to the cortex faster than the information coming back on the same side, which would be then crossed over with the corpus callosum. So the key is, is that both input and output both are slower with the adducting eye. The adducting eye is faster under both circumstances. Now there's also some interesting aspects that looked at some studies on optic chiasm lesions and also corpus callosum lesions. So what they found was, is that if you have an optic chiasm lesion, you lose motor fusion, which is nasal retina, okay? But you retain stereopsis. And then they found that if you had a genesis of corpus callosum further back, or basically had a surgery to cut the corpus callosum from let's say having seizure disorders and such, what happens is that they lose stereo, but they maintain motor fusion. So it's almost like your nasal fields are about motor fusion and your temporal retinal information is more about stereopsis. 
So again, what you want to look at is promoting localization first. Why? Because we know that you've got to have localized target for the motor system to be able to localize the target first, then you can perceive perceptually the stereo response following that. Stereo doesn't come first. What comes first is motor fusion and then the sensory stereopsis later. This is a couple diagrams out of it where they looked at the chiasmal lesions, where if you had a chiasmal lesion, again, the patient could retain stereopsis, but not have motor fusion. Agenesis of corpus callosum, the patient would go ahead and maintain motor fusion, but would lose stereopsis. No, binasal also promotes nasal to temporal motion processing and decreases the cross fixation pattern in these young infants. So you notice here, this young girl with her left eye is still picking up. We're gonna to have to go a little bit wider with this so that her right eye picks up fixation and can track laterally more efficiently. So what we're really looking for is, again, the patient with an esotropia to look into right gaze with the right eye, left gaze and left eye. And again, that decreases the cross fixation pattern. This really helps the younger infants in that they have to develop nasal to temporal motion processing nasal to temporal motion processing. And what happens here is, is that if you don't have alignment early on or the use and development of the nasal temporal motion processing, you're more likely to develop strabismus. So this is basically the time window, generally around three months is when you start developing this asymmetry and the strabismus may first start going on with these patients. So we wanna see these patients really early. So. One of the things that's interesting a lot of times is people will say, well, an infant, I can't do vision therapy with them. Well, certainly you cannot do uh, vectorgrams and things like that, but you can use a nasal sector to promote more normal development. That's the key for these young infants is getting them started right away. The asymmetries are not only found with motion processing for using an OKN drum, but also pursuits. So a young infant, if you cover one eye, and you do temporal to nasal tracking, it's very smooth, but when they go from nasal temporal, it's jerky, okay? And so this is just an example of the target being shown to the nasal temporal, it's jumping and then smooth from outside to in. So that's what you're really gonna be promoting again with a binasal. So again, it's not just about alignment, it's about promoting normal motion processing development as well. Now let's take a look at some other factors, central versus peripheral. If I go ahead and put a binasal on, I have actually decreased my attention to near space. If you think about proximal vergence, proximal vergence is part of what goes on with uh, the development of binocular vision. And if you go ahead and put a binasal up, what you've done essentially is you've eliminated proximal vergence. There's no target in here for you to pay attention to. So again, with a binasal, you're emphasizing more peripheral input. And remember, more peripheral, you're more likely to pick up larger targets and also emphasizes far versus near space. And then lastly, promotes nasal temporal tracking in lateral gaze. One other thing that you can think about with a binasal is it's really passive alternate occlusion for amblyopia. So if I have a refractive amblyopia and I've got the, the prescription that I've decided on that's most appropriate for the patient, they may still not be using that eye because it's still amblyopic. And when you put a place of binasal on, anytime the child looks over into that side, what do we have? We've got fixation and, and working on localization with it. So again, passive alternate occlusion is really what you end up getting with a binasal occlusion as well. Now, how do you apply it? Well, basically you can look at several different variables. We use what's called a streff wedge. It's just a, a wedge that we just slide down and it's narrow to wider. And we can use that. We usually use nail polish on plastic lenses. If you have anti-reflection coating that presents a problem because the nail polish will fall off of it. So we use scotch tape for that and trim it with opaque scotch tape. We always wanna recheck your results after you place the binasal and see what you're finding. And remember, you may not get a change right away you may be giving them a uh, binasal in the beginning and you don't see any changes for a week. It's also gonna be readjusting the position of it. You may do more asymmetry, less asymmetry, go wider, go narrower, depending on what your need is when you're evaluating the patient. A couple other things to think about frame selection. 
with a plastic frame. A plastic frame will be right up against the face. So I cannot look underneath the lens. If I had a metal frame, I might be able to sneak underneath, looking underneath and around the binasal from the inside. So usually we try to stay with plastic frames if possible. And again, be careful of anti-reflection coating. On our prescriptions, we always write no anti-reflection coating. And the reason for is that that binasal is much easier to deal with with nail polish, I think, than having to trim up scotch tape all the time. So again, here, what we've got is sometimes you can use banger or occlusion foil, but primarily we use scotch tape and nail polish. And then we have some nail polish remover and we remove it from there. Now here's a placement of a binasal. We've put the scotch, we've dotted the lens of where we wanted to put the line. And then we put scotch tape so I can paint in that area and be a nice straight area, nice looking. And then as it dries, you blot it. Now here's an example, poor application. You notice that I put the binasal over the line and what you'll see is a distorted line. So that's not a very good application because we did not stipple it very much in regards to as it was drying, making it opaque. This is an example of a better occlusion. You still have light going through it, but at the same time it's distorted the form of the lines as you can tell here. So this is a good presentation for uh, using binasal occlusion. Now let's say I want to go just a millimeter wider on a patient. I can put a piece of scotch tape in, take the, bi take the uh, applicator, and fill in the small hole, and now I have a little bit wider one. Now, placement of binasal related to the condition and goals. Remember, we talked about alignment, alternation, penalization. Those are things you're looking for in changing visual behaviors. How do I place it? Well, what I'm looking for generally is I'm looking for the patient to follow a pursuit target. And when they, if they're esotropic, um, the right eye's on here, and you keep going across, and they get over on the left side and finally the left eye comes in. What I want them to do is alternate their strabismic posture at midline. So they're following a target here, left eyes in, they get to midline right here. I want them now to use the left eye to pick up the target and the other eye turns in. So what I'm looking for is I'm gonna go ahead and penalize one side or the other to get a esotropia that's shifted over. So if I'm primarily right, right ET, I'm gonna go wider on the left, which will then get this eye coming on more when I'm coming across midline. The key to remember is you want them to alternate at midline. That's your, that's your goal for asymmetry and use of the binasal asymmetrically. So when they're crossing midline, the fixation should alternate. And then again, width and location are critical. We also generally slant it in because when you look into down space at near, you can get around it a little bit easier. And then also just normally looking out the room, the patient may be looking up and down and they're actually massaging that binasal during the day in regards to having it wider and narrower. Also remember we talked about immediate versus long-term long changes and modifying it over time. So we see these patients every week to two weeks and we're probably having an active therapy and we'll be alternating the, we'll be changing the binasal as we want. So the width of the binasal overview Effects on alternation, effects on fusion because of the, the, the size of the overlap, effects on sensory motor and asymmetry. Remember, the smaller the field, you're going to affect more sensory input. The larger the field, like a six nerve paresis or infantile esotropia, you want to go wider to get that muscle moving much more over time. So here's the left esotropia. He's having effort to be able to alternate both eyes. We placed a binasal on him. Now when he looks in the left gaze, he's penalized with that eye. So he's using his left eye more. And then here he is after two weeks, he was aligned actually with the binasal initially, but now we're looking at him and we're saying, wow, the left eye is starting to turn in again. So you, one concept would be go wider on the right side. But in this case, what we did is actually narrowed the left side a little bit more so that opens up more sensory input and then he's lined his eye up. So we'll take a look from this one, see where he's at here. Basically, he's just about at the pupil margin. And when we narrowed it, now the left eye came out again. So again, this is weaning him off of the binasal after he's changing his, his control of his eye, eye turn. 
So case presentations, we're just gonna show you a few things. Infantile isotropes, bilateral abduction deficits are common. Uh, sometimes you can have unilateral as well. We can use uh, binasals for convergent spasm, left cranial nerve six paresis, bilateral six nerve paresis, and brain injury. So here's an example of dispensing, and we're setting up a little bit of asymmetry here for this patient, primarily more left ET. And we went through uh, doing therapy with her, a lot of red-green activities we can do even with a young two-year-old. And she, she is six months after, now maintaining uh, fusion and holding both eyes together. And we're going to still be doing therapy with her. She's now probably 16 years old or so, and she's doing great. So here's a conversion spasm case. And again, how do we get rid of that near space to get her out? Here's the wedge, placing it in, trying to look at it. And you can see where she lines up with penalizing the left side slightly. And then we're doing lots of peripheral activities, working on lateral gaze, turn and catch, turn and clap types of activities. And then here she is now with the binasal still aligned and we're gonna slowly decrease it over time. Uh, left cranial nerve six paresis. Again, the patient looking in left gaze, the patient has double vision because the left eye will not go out. We use a nasal sector in this type of case, only one side, which allows some fusion, which he still maintains in primary gaze, but in left gaze, he was double. So when he looks into left gaze, you're blocking the right eye so that the left eye has an opportunity to continue practicing and working on the abduction deficit. In many cases, what would generally happen in the hospital is ophthalmology would generally patch the left eye, which is like, if I have a weak hemiplegic leg, it'd be like setting a cast on the leg and not working on recovery. So this promotes both maintenance of the single vision he has in right gaze, but promotes abduction control in the left eye. Lastly here, we've got a brain injury patient. We put in a binasal, slipped it down until she felt that it decreased her dizziness. We placed it in the middle slide and notice that that's about the inner canthus on both eyes. And she was sitting watching um, the screen and just being in the room, she felt pretty comfortable. We walked her out in the hallway and she was still really dizzy. This is the key for many of your post-trauma vision syndrome cases or brain injury cases. Generally, narrower is better. So what we did was in the third slide, we narrowed it more so that she could do it. So much more uh, emphasis on sensory, just decreasing a little bit of the sensory noise in the system so that her amplitudes would go up and her dizziness symptoms would decrease. Uh, nice study by Kafrida, looking at effects of binasal occlusion on VEP findings. That's just a little bit of research on, that, on this area. The one thing you gotta be careful about, <coughs> excuse me, is Kafrida's articles, if you look at him, you'll see he used black opaque tape on these and they're completely clear out to the iris. Now in a clinical setting looking for VEP findings, I can understand that. But that same patient, if they were to walk out in an environment with a wide binasal, then they're gonna be in trouble. So in the case of this study, when you look at it, you'll probably see a very wide binasal remember that that's for static conditions sitting in an exam chair. When they go out in the environment, they're gonna, go, they're gonna wanna go narrower. So effects of a binasal, decreasing or eliminate diplopia or confusion, less likely to develop suppression, more emphasis on peripheral awareness. You can modify fixation preference, a right ET versus left ET. You can promote alternation. You can decrease anomalous correspondence. You can promote abducting eye to lead localization you can eliminate cross fixation patterns. So a binasal tool has a lot of different benefits that you can use it for in different types of cases. So we wanna improve abduction for these patients. If, remember too, that if you have a uh, recent cranial nerve six paresis and the eye is turning in, if you pass that eye, you don't learn to be able to keep going and you can develop contracture and atrophy of those muscles. So the binasal is a great tool to immediately decrease the possibility of that. We want to improve nasal temporal tracking, modify central peripheral relationships. Again, just basic things that we're going to look for. Lastly, amblyopia prevention and also for treatment too. So in summary, there's no two binasals that are the same. Really, they're, they're different widths, they're different visual needs. The key is 
you have to determine what is it, what is our goal for this patient? And then we want to consider binasal occlusion as probably one of your most important tools in your toolbox. Louis Jakes, uh, back in the early 40s and 50s, he wrote about this and felt that the binasal occlusion was the very best tool. I would say lenses are. And binasal occlusion combined is a great pair of tools for us. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to share with you all today and I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kurt. And this was a very informative talk on binasal occlusion. And some of the highlights of the topic where they were talking about how binasal occlusion are used in various conditions like traumatic brain injuries or various conditions. And also how to apply binasal patches was really informative by using different materials uh, followed with that, the takeaway message. I had a question. Uh, well, the question is like, uh, uh, you're talking about uh, binasal occlusion and we follow the wedge to pass through it. What should be the fixation target should be given for a patient? Is it a near target or is it a far target which is given when you do a, a binasal wedge is passed through uh, for marking the uh, binasal occlusion points? Good question. Um, in regards to what we generally use is I'll look a, use a wolf wand, just a small uh, silver ball, size of your pinky finger or so, and have the patient just scan across. Remember, the problem with a binasal though is that in primary gaze, that's what we're testing. But their life is maybe 60% here and 20% here, 20% here. So it's going to be asymmetric. Um, my, my basic feeling is that if you just watch the target go across and they alternate at midline, that's your goal. And then you go ahead and place it on. And from there, what you then is get them to be out in space. Like we talked about the one girl, we walked outside in the hallway and then her dizziness still was resuming. So we knew we were a little bit too wide because she could pick up the edge of it. So we narrowed it down a little bit more for her. But again, the, for us, really the big take home message hopefully is that helping that if you're primarily one eye esotropia type of case, <clears throat> what you want to do is get them to be using that eye more regularly. And to do that, you can place the binasal asymmetrically to make this eye work better because you penalize the better eye. So that, I think that's a good way to look at it. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the information. And uh, for all the audience uh, who are watching this, uh, you can put up your questions in the chat box and we'll be able to reply back to you for your questions. And uh, thank you once again, uh, Dr. Kurt. And uh, all of you stay safe and stay healthy. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the day. Okay. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, so I think we're okay. Uh, Are you there? Dr. Kurt, uh, yeah. I think I have made you the host. Uh, you have to press the recording button to stop. Okay. Yeah. Just stop it. <laughs>